we certainly want to stay on time. Um, uh, so it's really um, a privilege for me to introduce uh, today's speaker for the, the Blanche Tulman Lectureship. Uh, this is a lectureship that was established by, the, by, the, by Dr. Sears and his family um, in uh, memory of uh, their mother, uh, Blanche Tulman, who passed away with hem hemologic malignancy. and allows us an opportunity to invite uh, every year a uh, pioneering scientist uh, who's working on hemo malignancies. Uh, so it's really an honor for me uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, uh, Stan Riddell uh, from Fred Hutchinson Cancer uh, Center. Uh, Dr. Riddell uh, uh, obtained his uh, MD from University of Manitoba um, and uh, did his initial medical training at, uh, at Manitoba and then moved to uh, Seattle um, in uh, 1985. Um, and uh, essentially, basically, I think he liked Seattle so much he's stayed there pretty much ever since. Uh, but um, uh, uh, and in, in his uh, risen to the ranks uh, to currently as a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, uh, professor of medicine, um, and currently the director of Immunotherapy Integrated Research Center at the Fred Hutch. Uh, he is really um, uh, a pioneer um, in the field of T cell therapy. I think he really uh, wrote the book. On this, in my view, uh, taught us how to grow T cells, um, and uh, was the first person uh, to uh, really uh, trans, uh, inject uh, T cells in human beings uh, in the context of, for example, uh, trying to uh, eradicate CMV infection. This is a paper that we just we we're just talking about was 25 years ago, um, uh, long before CAR T cells were even thought of. Um, uh, uh, he's been a recipient of many uh, awards. I'm not going to list them all, but uh, the some notable um, ones are uh, the Donald Thomas Lecture um, uh, from the ASBMT, um, and he's also the Virginia Trust uh, uh, Research Professor of the American Cancer Society. Um, uh, Dr. Riddell has played a, a major role in the development of uh, uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells and um, uh, and taught us really how to uh, best utilize them and how to improve them. Um, and uh, he's uh, going to tell us about uh, this title of his today's talk is uh, Strategies to Enhance the Efficacy of CAR T cells. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Madhav. It's, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Um, I particularly enjoyed the meeting this morning with the students and, and, and the fellows. Um, really uh, in, incredible to see the energy. Um, but I was telling you how long I've been at, at the Hutch in Seattle, and I'm sort of feeling old when I saw those young faces and, and all that energy that they bring to their work. So um, it is a pleasure to be here, though. So today I'm going to talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing trying to understand and manipulate uh, T cells for therapeutic efficacy, particularly in hematologic malignancies, and those are my disclosures. Um, so as, as many of you know, and in fact many of you are part of this, there's really a, a revolution going on in, in cancer therapy these days based on using the immune system uh, to treat cancer. And, um, you know, I, I was in the field um, when we used to go to ACR, and you'd give a lecture, um, and there were five people in the room, and three of them were from your lab, and one was the AV guy, and the other guy just wandered in. Um, but now if you go to AACR, the room is entirely packed. There's an overflow, um, and, and it really, I think, speaks to the, to the rapid progress that's been made in this field. Having said that, um, and despite the fact that there are many publications um, in high-profile journals, there still is a lot of work to do, and I think we need to be cognizant of, of that fact. But why is it that, that um, immunotherapy sort of got to this place? Well, the first thing is that we've learned that tumors are not uh, completely ignored by T cells. Um, you know, you can now look at virtually any uh, histologic type of cancer, and you can correlate T cell infiltration with prognosis of that tumor, independent of any therapy. Um, we've, through the work of Jim Allison, um, Hanjo, and, and others, we've learned that there are immunologic checkpoints that actually restrain T cell reactivity against tumors. And the efficacy of those antibodies, many of the, the pioneering work was done here at Yale in clinical trials demonstrating that these uh, checkpoint antibodies that, that, that uh, have profound effects uh, in patients with melanoma and now extending into other solid tumors. 
my work is focused um, on, on trying to use T cells therapeutically by adoptive transfers. So in patients, for example, that don't have an endogenous response that can be uh, harnessed uh, to treat their tumor, um, we've looked at whether or not we can engineer T cells uh, to target them. And I'm going to sort of focus on two areas of advancement that I think that have helped us to, to do that. One is um, an improved understanding of T cell differentiation, and the other is actually technical advances that have occurred in gene therapy and synthetic biology. You know, it sort of comes as a surprise even to people like me that have actually been in the field that, that, some of, that this, this works as well as it does. Um, so there are sort of uh, two uh, areas of focus um, in the lab. Um, one is to use uh, T cell receptors that target uh, peptide MHC complexes, and these can uh, target antigens that are inside of tumor cells that are processed and presented as peptide fragments on the HLA molecules of the tumor. Um, and uh, these can, there's a variety of different uh, targets, uh, overexpressed antigens, aberrantly expressed proteins, neoantigens um, that can be targeted by these T cell receptors. And I'm not going to talk about our work in, in T cell receptors today, but just to say that I think that this is uh, an area that you're going to see uh, dramatically expand over the next few years. What I'm going to focus on are these synthetic receptors that we engineer in the lab. These are things called chimeric antigen receptors, or CARs. Um, these are, are uh, uh, molecules that are designed typically with an, an, a ligand binding domain, often from a, a single chain variable fragment of a monoclonal antibody that's now linked in tandem um, to T cell receptor signaling molecules uh, and to uh, co stimulatory molecules. Um, and these now don't target uh, 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 molecules that are inside the cell that are processed and presented, but rather tar target molecules that are present on the cell surface. So things like lineage-specific molecules uh, can be targeted. Now, when I first started working on CARs about 15 years ago, I thought they would be wonderful tools for understanding T-cell activation. I never actually uh, imagined that they would be as therapeutically effective. And I think the reason for that is I just didn't think we were smart enough to essentially engineer something that would actually work as well as our native T-cell receptor that has evolved over many, many years. But you can uh, engineer these receptors, and you can express them in, in vectors, either uh, retroviral or lentiviral vectors, and you can very easily introduce them into, into T cells. And the one wonderful thing about human T cells is they're very easy to genetically manipulate. Um, now, the other beautiful thing about CAR T cells um, and T cells in general is that they are a living therapy. And this just shows you a plate of tumor cells uh, and, and some T cells that have been engineered with a CAR that targets a surface molecule in the tumor. And you can see these cells migrate around the dish, gobble up the tumor cells, um, and, uh, and destroy them. Um, and this is very, very different than chemotherapy. Now, I give a lot of chemotherapy in, in my day. And chemotherapy works, uh, you know, we, we all, we administer cycle after cycle of chemotherapy. We kill a fraction of the tumor cells with each cycle, and eventually there's some resistant clones that aren't killed anymore, and those cells uh, will outgrow. T cell therapy is designed to be very, very different. That is, you give a single infusion of cells that can target the cancer. Those cells will actually expand in the patient, so it's a single dose, unlike chemotherapy where you're giving cycle after cycle and they will eliminate virtually all of the antigen-positive tumor cells. And then they have the advantage of potentially providing long-term uh, immunologic memory. So this is a living therapy that can persist uh, long-term, as I'll show you. Now, the, the paradigm for CAR T cells um, is really uh, targeting B cell malignancies. And the reason for that um, is that there are lineage-specific molecules that are expressed in the B cell lineage through all stages of maturation, um, they get the, the, the molecules that are turned on as the stem cell differentiates into B cells. So things like CD19 and CD22 that are present in ALL, uh, and then a variety of other molecules, some of which like CD20 come on a little bit later. And these are expressed on the malignancies that are derived from these various stages of B cell differentiation. So we can actually target diseases like ALL, mantle cell lymphoma, uh, follicular and, and diffuse large cell lymphoma, and when you get then to multiple myeloma, many of the, the typical B cell markers go off, but additional markers, things like BCMA, uh, FCRH5, and SLAMF7 come on that can also be targets uh, for CAR T cells. So this is essentially our playground um, for CAR T cells. And extending it beyond B cell malignancies is a challenge that the field faces right now. Um, and, and I won't talk about that today, but I think we are starting to make progress. Now, when we got into this uh, space, um, we were interested in the signaling properties of these molecules, of these cars. Um, and this is some work that Michael Hudicek did when he was in the lab. Um, and essentially what we decided to look at is how do we actually optimally engineer these receptors? And so you have the ligand binding domain. 
Um, but then you have this sequence between the, the SCFV and the transmembrane domain uh, of the receptor on the T cell. And this, of course, you can adjust the space of this. And typically, people use uh, uh, immunoglobulin and FC regions uh, at, in the spacer region. You can use a variety of other things, CD8 alpha hinge, uh, a variety of uh, di different spacer sequences. Uh, but the length of the spacer ultimately will have some effect on the synapse formation between the T cell and the target cell. Um, and then, of course, you have co-stimulatory domains that you can incorporate. Most people use 41BB or CD28 linked to CD3 zeta. And then in all of our CAR constructs, we actually encode uh, a truncated epidermal growth factor receptor that's truncated in this EGF binding domain, and it's truncated in the signaling domain, but it actually retains the epitope for herbitux. And that allows us to actually uh, quantify the cells that are transduced uh, and to select them, for example, and, and as I'll show you, to track them in vivo and, and do other things. Um, but just to show you that the spacer region actually does matter, this is uh, CD19 cars all designed with a 41 bb zeta uh, construct that have a short hinge, so just this 12 amino acid uh, sequence here, or that have an intermediate uh, CH3, uh, hinge CH3 or hinge CH2, CH3 domain. And you can see that even though these cars all function, they all produce cytokines when they're stimulated with, uh, with uh, CD19 positive target cells, uh, the one with the short spacer functions optimally. And you can also see that uh, based on the proliferation. And these will kill, certainly kill tumor cells. And so before we went into the clinic, um, we decided to actually test uh, these receptors in vivo in mice. So these are now mice that are engrafted with a human lymphoma cell line that's luciferase labeled, so you can see the lymphoma cells here before we treat them. And then if you give a single dose of CAR T cells with a short spacer, you can see that, um, that this is the control in red, um, nothing happens, but if you give the, the CAR T cells to, to tumor-bearing mice, you can see you eliminate the tumor in all of the mice. But the surprising thing was that long spacer that I showed you didn't function very well in vitro, but still functioned, was completely ineffective. It had absolutely no activity at all. And we were a little bit perplexed by this because most of the in vitro assays suggested that it should have some activity. And it didn't matter what dose you gave, these cells were ineffective. So when we started to look at the persistence of the cells in vivo, we found that these cars that had the long spacer actually disappeared from the blood uh, very, very quickly after transfer. Um, so they were able to go in, um, but they, they were uh, uh, essentially not persisting. And the question was, are they not persisting because they're not getting activated, or are they not persisting because they're actually undergoing activation induced, induced cell death? So what we did was we CFSC labeled the cells so we could actually track them and did a few experiments. So the first here, we're just looking at, do they get activated in, vitro, in vivo? So this is the short spacer car, and you can see you put these cells in. You can find them immediately in the blood. Uh, these cells actually do um, uh, upregulate CD69 and CD25, but so do the long spacer cars. Even though there's fewer of them, they, they do get activated. Um, this is the CFSC. They haven't started to proliferate yet uh, at 24 hours, but by 72 hours after transfer, uh, transfer, the short spacer cars have proliferated extensively, and there's very little activation-induced cell death. Whereas the long spacer cars have started to proliferate, but there's a huge amount of activation-induced cell death. So these cells, um, it, that seemed to us that they were actually getting too strong of a signal. Um, and the question was, is that due to an aberrant synapse formation or to something else? So one of the things we were concerned about is that long spacer car has the full-length FC region of the IgG4 uh, uh, immunoglobulin. And of course, FCs bind to FC receptors. Um, and so what we're doing in this experiment is we actually labeled now uh, the CAR T cells with luciferase so we could track their migration. So when you infuse them with the short spacer car, you can see they initially home to the lung. And then within 24 hours, they migrate out of the lung and begin to migrate to other sites, including the tumor. Um, but you can see the long spacer car, they're in the lung at one hour as the short spacer cars were, but they stay there. Um, they actually can't migrate out of the lung very effectively. Very few of them get out. They are highly activated in the lung. You can see they upregulate uh, CD69 and CD25, but there's no tumor in the lung. So this was a little perplexing to us. But what is present in the lung, even in not skid mice, are myeloid cells that have uh, that are LY6C positive, and actually um, these cells do actually bind IG, human IgG4. They do have FC receptors, and they actually are activating the cells. So this is really essentially uh, off-target uh, uh, recognition of myeloid cells that express FC receptors. And these cells, uh, if you just make transfectants that actually have the FCR, they will actually uh, bind and get recognized. Now, I will point out, this was a lot of work to do to just uh, essentially show that this was a car that shouldn't be used in the clinic. Now, having said that, 
these cars were going into the clinic. Um, and um, if you really look at the data that came out of the long spacer cars, they were the least effective of any uh, against CD19. Um, so, but there are some cars that need that long spacer for optimal synapse formation. So what we did is we made mutations uh, in the long spacer region to abrogate FC receptor binding. And these are the mutations that we made in the CH2 and one mutation here um, downstream that actually is involved in glycosylation. And when you make this, this what we call the long 4-2-NQ, it no longer uh, upregulates CD25 when it's exposed to FCR positive cells, and these cells are actually highly effective uh, in vivo. So the, the long spacer cars can work um, uh, effectively, but they need to be designed to abrogate FC receptor binding. So this is another message, is that when we start to make these synthetic receptors, we put components together, we need to think about how they function. So the other area that we were interested in is this issue of co-stimulatory signaling. Um, and the approach that uh, Alex Salter, who was a graduate student in the lab, took to, to, to try and understand this was to actually use mass spectrometry to look at whole cell phosphoproteomic signaling when we activate CAR T cells. Um, so what we designed here is this is the CD19 uh, FMC63 SCFE. We also did this with another car against another molecule called RUR1. Um, so these, these cars were designed um, now with, uh, with uh, either CD28 or 41BB. Um, they again have the EGFR tag so we can purify them. But what we did with these cars is we introduced this uh, a 9 amino acid strep tag 2 sequence into the spacer region. This doesn't interfere with car function. We published this a couple of years ago in Nature Biotech. Uh, but what it does allow you to do is actually now use an antibody against ST2 on a microbead to actually activate car signaling. So this now allowed us, in a, in a way, um, with a bead, to activate the CAR T cells and really evaluate downstream signaling uh, in otherwise completely identical uh, cars except for the co-stimulatory domain. So um, these cars uh, have a very similar phenotype. The only th difference that we noticed was that uh, CD28 cars uh, do tend to, some of them start to lose uh, CD62L expression, but otherwise it's identical. There's no evidence of tonic signaling of these receptors, and the receptors are expressed uh, at identical levels. So what we then did was essentially take the, uh, these are purified human CAR T cells, uh, we stimulate them for 10 minutes with the beads against anti-ST2 or, or un leave them unstimulated. We do it for 10 and 45 minutes, and we do 28 MBB zeta. We use this TMT labeling approach for mass spec, which allows you to actually run multiple samples, and we look both for phosphorylations on trypsin as well as uh, serine and threonine residues. Now, these are really deep experiments. So you're looking at thousands of phosphocytes. Um, and we did overlapping. So in, a, in an individual experiment, you might get up to 21,000 sites that you're actually looking at. The overlap is usually pretty good. More than 50% of the sites are actually uh, seen in, in, in repeat experiments. Um, if you actually look, though, the surprising thing was we thought that CD28 and 41BB would actually activate very different signaling pathways based on the different co-stimulation. But in fact, that's not true. More than 99% of the phosphocytes that are changed with CAR activation are identical between CD28 and 41BB. And that includes activation of canonical signaling molecules in the CD28 pathway with the 41BB receptor and in the 41BB pathway with the CD28 receptor. So the idea that we really are controlling the signaling uh, by putting in these different co-stimulatory domains uh, is not really so true. There's a few phosphocytes that are different. I'm not going to discuss those in detail today. Um, oh, this didn't show up. I should have checked. Well, then what this was, was this is actually important data too. This was actually the volcano plots looking at the, the, the change uh, uh, in stimulated versus control in the 28 and 41 BB. And what this shows um, is that the CD28 car, the difference is that it signals with much more rapid kinetics and with increased magnitude. So you get greater change in phosphorylation. And this is actually shown for the top uh, uh, 30 sites here um, between the 28 and 41 BB at 10 minutes and, and, and 45 minutes. You can see that the log fold change in phosphorylation at these sites is much greater with the 28 zeta car compared to the 41 BB zeta car. And this is true at both time points. So this more intense uh, uh, signaling is what really distinguishes these receptors. And this has consequences for the cell. So what happens is if you look at the, the cell entering the cell cycle, this is now uh, just looking at the percent of cells in G0, G1 over the first 24 hours, you can see that the CD28 zeta cars uh, enter the cell cycle much more rapidly than the 41BB zeta cars, 
They produce uh, more cytokines, and again, another volcano plot that's not showing up, uh, it's the problem with MACA-PC, um, shows that in fact the CD28 cars are downregulating several genes that are involved in memory formation. And so what we really think is the intensity of the signal um, actually dictates whether or not these cells um, uh, rapidly proliferate, produce high levels of cytokines, and can, are able to persist as memory cells, which we would argue the C28 cars do not do as well, uh, and the clinical data is, in fact, bearing that out. Um, now, there's obviously a lot more data to be mined um, um, from studying these receptors and, and how they signal, but I think the sort of paradigm that because we put CD28 and we're activating the CD28 pathway or put 41BB and we're activating the 41BB pathway, really that's not uh, shown to be true. These receptors signal very, very differently than T cell receptors. And we now have a phosphoproteome data set um, comparing TCR and CAR signaling in the same T cell. Um, but I want to now move to the T cell because the therapeutic is not just the CAR. It's the CAR and the T cell that you put it into. Um, and as many of you know, there is a differentiation pathway uh, that T cells undergo when a naive T cell is activated by antigen. It differentiates into stem cell memory and central memory cells that both have stem cell properties and are capable of self renewal, which has been proven for this cell. Um, they also differentiate into effective memory cells, tissue resident memory cells, and effector cells, and eventually cells that die. Now, this is a progressive differentiation pathway that's supported by transcriptional and epigenetic <laughs> profiling of these cells. And previous work that we did in non-human primates showed that if you adoptively transferred effector cells derived from this cell, but not this cell, these cells would persist long-term and reconstitute functional memory. Um, so we were very interested in how this might uh, dictate what cells you ought to engineer with CARs. So we did some experiments with Dirk Busch um, uh, in Munich. Uh, Dirk has is really a leader in, in doing fate mapping of single T cells um, using mouse models. And so the way this experiment was set up is that we took um, uh, T cells from OT1 mice. So these are now T cells that have a transgenic receptor uh, that sees the OVA peptide. Uh, and we would transfer naive T cells into a wild type mice, mouse, and then actually challenge this mouse with Listeria OVA to expand memory populations. And you would get both central and effector memory. And then what you would do is you would transfer uh, central memory or effective memory cells from that mouse into a secondary mouse and subsequently into a tertiary mouse. Now, these experiments take a long time because memory formation, you know, you really have to wait at least 60 days. So this was really essentially uh, a two-year project. Um, but what we found was that if you transfer um, a large number of cells, so this is 100 uh, central memory cells, you always get full recovery of the, the uh, of functional immunity in the recipient. But if you transfer effector memory cells, you can see that when you get to the tertiary transfer, you get no transfer of immunity. So this really said that central memory cells have this capacity to essentially provide protective and long-term immunity, whereas effector memory cells don't. Now, the key part of this experiment was actually to now not do this with 100 cells, but actually to do this with single cells. So if you now transfer a single central memory <coughs> cell through three generations, in about 20 to 30% of the mice from transferring that one cell, you will essentially be able to re-expand central memory, effective memory, and effector cells um, uh, by re-challenging those mice with stereova derived from that single cell. And, and if you take then those tertiary cells and transfer them into rag mice, you can actually protect those mice with as few as 10 central memory cells. So again, this says that the central memory cell has the capacity for both self-renewal, because as a single cell, it can recapitulate itself, as well as progressive differentiation to effector memory and effector cells. So that really essentially is the definition of a stem cell. <clears throat> so the question then was, well, how does this relate to CAR T cells? So to do this, we turned uh, to uh, a, a, a not skid mouse model using human cells now. This was work done by Daniel Sommermeyer, where essentially we sort purified naive central memory and effector memory cells, did the bead stimulation with anti-CD3, CD28, selected the transduced cells based on EGFRT expression, and then we could analyze their phenotype and actually compare them uh, on a cell per cell basis in terms of their efficacy in non-skid mice and grafted with lymphoma. So this is the data. If you just look at the CD8 subsets alone, again, what we saw was similar to what we observed in the mice is that the central memory cells now have a greater capacity to treat the tumor, um, this is, again, done at a, at, a, at a titrating dose so that we can actually distinguish differences. If you give massive doses of cells in this model, of course, you can cure all the mice. Uh, 
But the central memory cells are more effective than naive cells or effective memory cells. And with the CD4 cells, both the naive and central memory cells were highly effective. And again, the effective memory cells were not. Now, what we then did was said, OK, what if we now start to combine these cells, uh, subsets together? And so what we did in this experiment, and this is actually cells from a patient that had a lymphoma that was treated on our CD19 CAR trial. Yeah. So if we just took his purple blood T cells and transduced them, and treated the mouse with now, again, a titrated dose of cells. Um, we gave 800,000 cells in this experiment. You can see that eventually the mice progress. If we gave eight central memory cells, uh, again, at 800,000 cells, we had a better at initial anti-tumor effect, but they eventually progressed. If we gave the most effective naive uh, subset from the CD4s, again, they were less effective uh, than the CD8s. And these are, again, all at 800,000 cells. But now if we combine the two most effective subsets, at the same total dose. So now we're giving 400,000 cells, 8 cents per memory, 400,000 cells of naive. You can see we cure all of the mice. So you can improve the potency by essentially engineering a defined composition product that has cells that are capable of proliferating, <coughs> differentiating to effective cells, and persisting. Um, and that, that, uh, that uh, remainder of that data is shown in, in the paper that Daniel published. Now, purifying uh, individual subsets can get fairly challenging. So we wanted to know if we just did eight central memory and four bulk, so unselected CD4 cells, you can see that that product was also quite effective. And that's ultimately what we took to the clinic. So um, when we started our CAR trials, what we wanted to do was to, in fact, do uh, CAR T cells where we were defining the composition of the product. Um, now, there's some reasons to do that. If you actually take patients that you're going to treat with CAR T cells, most of them have failed, or all of them have failed chemotherapy. Many of them have failed a transplant. They're going to have very uh, poor peripheral lymphocyte counts and often very skewed uh, subset distributions. So this is, I think, the th first 30 or 40 patients we treated on a trial. And you can see that they had variable numbers of CD8 cells and CD4 cells, always less than healthy donors, but sometimes really, really low. I mean, we're talking you know, 10, 15, 20 cells per microliter. If you look at the subset distribution, they always tended to have expanded populations of these effector memory, effector memory RA cells, which I've shown you are the least effective cells therapeutically. So what we decided to do to try and understand if we could define dose response and dose efficacy or dose toxicity relationships was to purify CD4 cells and if possible, um, purify central memory cells. Sometimes there were too few of them. So CD4 cells and eight central memory cells, or if not, we would just purify CD8 cells and then formulate a one-to-one CD4, CD8 uh, composition based on EGFRT expression. And this is the clinical trial that's led by David Maloney and Cameron Turtle. Um, so this was the trial, um, and, and this, I have to point out, is an intensive treat trial. So we took all comers. We had no exclusion criteria based on their disease. So if they had um, you know, circulating tumor, it didn't matter. We had no exclusion criteria based on their lymphocyte count. Um, so we took patients that literally had 10 to 20 uh, T cells per microliter of blood. Um, they had to be adults. And we've now treated um, more than 170 patients on this trial. This is a little bit outdated. So the first question was, was is it feasible to actually try and manufacture this defined composition product? The second question was safety. And we started out with very low doses of cells. This is dose level one. And I will tell you that this is the dose level that we now use routinely in relapsed refractory ALL. That's not very hard to manufacture. You don't need wave bioreactors. Um, you can do that. I always tell people I can do that in my garage. But, um, but, and, and then we went up in a dose escalation. And then we looked at anti-tumor efficacy, and we looked at, at, at the role of lymphodepleting chemotherapy, which I'll come back to. Because in all of the CAR T-cell trials, you do induce lymphodepletion with chemotherapy to provide space and actually increase the levels of homeostatic, homeostatic cytokines to support the transfer, uh, uh, the, the survival of your transferred cells. So I'm going to go through data in ALL, diffuse large cell, and, uh, and a, a little bit of CLL beta. So this is the first cohort of patients. This was published last year. So 36 ALL patients, um, they all had a refractory disease. The one patient that had no marrow glass had uh, isolated refractory CNS leukemia. And, and um, that is important because you can actually cure refractory CNS leukemia with CAR T cells because that patient got a complete remission. Some of them had extramedullary disease. They all had failed multiple lines of therapy. Um, a third of them had had a prior allogeneic transplant. And we initially started out just giving cytoxan alone. 
uh, and then we added in fludarabine. So about two-thirds of the patients got fludarabine, one-third cytoxin, and you'll see why. Um, so this is the response data. So we had, uh, looking at morphology in the bone marrow, now keep in mind um, um, all but one had uh, bone marrow disease. We actually had a CR in 100%. But if you look at flow cytometry, which is really the gold standard for looking at CR, we had a CR rate of 94%. But if you look at deep sequencing for the clonal IGH rearrangement in the leukemia, at day 28, so this is data at day 28, 65% of the patients that had morphologic disease when we started had become a molecular remission by day 28. Uh, and another 25% actually had less than 10 copies. And the patients that had extramedullary disease uh, also achieved a CR at, at a very high rate. Now importantly, in this intent to treat study, we manufactured CAR T cells to the target dose. Remember, we dose escalated uh, and de escalated depending on toxicity. But we manu manufactured a dose for all of the patients, and 92% actually got that defined one to one ratio composition. So this is feasible to do. Um, and we do our lymphodepletion depletion and CAR T cells in infusion in the outpatient department, and about three quarters of the patients actually get treated uh, in, in the clinic. Uh, with their CAR T cells. They only get admitted to the hospital if they develop uh, a later toxicity. This is just an example of flow cytometry looking at how rapidly you can clear uh, uh, profound disease in the bone marrow. The red dots are essentially the, the leukemia cells, the CD19 positive leukemia cells. And you can see by 17 days this patient <coughs> was completely um, uh, negative for leukemia cells, also negative for uh, B cells. Now, with the defined composition product, we observe something that I think is really important. And that is, is that the kinetics of CAR T cell expansion is now dose-related. Um, now, that's important if you think about a therapeutic. You like to understand how the dose um, affects the behavior of that therapeutic. So here we're looking at the number of CD8 and CD4 CAR T cells in the blood. And you can see at that low dose level, there's a more delayed peak uh, and a lower peak. At the higher dose level, um, this is dose level one and dose level two. I'm only showing you very few patients got treated at dose level three because it was too toxic. But you can see at dose level two, you get a more rapid peak and a higher peak. Um, and, and these are significant numbers. Here we're up to you know 500 cells per microliter. Here 100 cells per microliter. So these are very large numbers of CAR T cells in the blood. And in fact, you can do flow cytometry. And you know if, if there was um, an LCMV uh, T cell um, mouse immunologist in the room, they would say, well, this looks like an LCMV response because the CAR T cells expand and contract as the tumor uh, is being eradicated. So, so CAR T cell expansion correlates with, with, uh, with dose, but it also correlates with tumor burden and with toxicity. So if you have a patient where you get this very rapid uh, uh, elevation of CAR T cell numbers, um, you will have a higher risk of toxicity. And this was very important because what it allowed us to do is in patients that had a high tumor burden, we would use this lower dose, and that risk-adapted dosing reduced the, the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity rate without compromising the complete remission rate. And so this is the dose, that little tiny dose of T-cells that we routinely administer uh, to patients with uh, refractory ALL. So the other question I mentioned was we did test different lymphodepleting regimens, um, and the question that we first asked was, did it matter um, in terms of the initial response, and the answer was no. The CR rate was identical if you use cytoxin or cytoxin uh, and combined with fludarabine. But what it did matter in was the duration of remission and the persistence of the CAR T cells. And you can see here now, this is the psi flu group, and this is the psi alone group. So the psi flu group had, a, again, a higher peak and a longer persistence. You can see on the spider plots here going out, and many of these patients have persisting CAR T cells for more than a year. Um, whereas the side flu group contracts more quickly and many of them actually lose their CAR T cells. And the reason is, is that fludarabine is a very T cell suppressive drug that you give before the CAR T cells. So it suppresses the endogenous T cells in the patient. And what, ha what happens is in these patients that lose their CAR T cells, that got cytoxin alone, they actually develop a T cell response to epitopes from the mouse SCFE that's used in the CAR. So these CARs can be immunogenic. And so the reason that the fludarabine helps is not only because of the more profound lymphodepletion, but it also al allows long-term persistence because it prevents the immune response. And that data was published. But importantly, that affects outcomes. So in this relapsed refractory group, the patients that got side flu, um, we have about a 58% uh, uh, long-term disease-free survival. The overall survival is over 
Um, but you can see the side group alone did very poorly. And the reason is these patients down here relapsed with CD19 positive disease because they lose their CAR T cells too early. These patients, if they relapse, they relapse with CD19 negative disease because they have persistent immunologic memory against the tumor. Um, so there's very different mechanisms of relapse and mechanisms of failure. Um, and so I, I think that what this tells you is the CAR T cells do have to hang around for a, a fairly long period of time. We don't know exactly how long, but from some data from a trial in, in children from Mike Jensen, it looks like patients that have CAR T cells beyond six months are the ones that uh, essentially have the highest rate of durable remission. So I just want to talk a little bit about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, we, this is essentially on the same trial. Um, so here we treated, uh, we published this in Science Translational Medicine last year. We treated 41 patients. Again, mostly aggressive histologies, um, multiple prior lines of therapy. About half of them had had a prior auto or allo. Um, and again, we did initially test the psi alone versus the psi flu. Um, but um, it, it, here we ended up using the psi flu pretty uniformly after the first few patients because of the ALL data. Now what you'll notice is that, uh, first of all, the CR rate, uh, even at the optimal regimen, and for lymphoma you need a higher dose level. So we use dose level two here. It's about 50%. Um, the overall response rate's about 80%. Um, all histologies and, and, and stages of disease respond. But the CR rate is clearly lower than an ALL. Even pretty bulky disease can respond. Um, you can see this is a patient that had refractory disease in, in the neck, mediastinum, axilla, and within 30 days, again, this very, very rapid uh, elimination of really kilograms of tumor. Um, but not all patients respond quickly. So this was a patient that had a primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma that had spread to the kidney. And you can see this large PET-positive lesion in the kidney. And one month after CAR T-cells, we were disappointed to see that this lesion uh, was still there. Um, so we are trying to understand mechanisms of resistance. And so what we did is we put a needle into that lesion to see what we would get back. Whoops. Um, and what we got back was essentially... Uh, if you look at the CD45 positive cells, we didn't find any B cells. All we found was, were pretty much uh, CAR T cells um, that were present in this lesion. Now, I presume there's some tumor in there, but it's obviously heavily, heavily infiltrated with CAR T cells. So in this patient, we decided just to wait and see what happened. And a month later, the patient uh, is in a CR and is now more than two and a half years out uh, in complete remission. So sometimes complete tumor eradication can be delayed. Um, and it really, I think, does help uh, in these patients that have persistent disease, if possible, to get a biopsy to understand what's going on. Now, it doesn't always um, go that way. So here is another patient, and I'm just showing you. This was a diffuse large cell patient that had um, extensive disease uh, in the abdomen and, and lymph nodes. I'm just showing you some index lesions in the liver. Uh, again, you can see PET positive lesions here. Five weeks after CAR T cells, we had a good response, but clearly still an abnormal lesion. Now, this patient had circulating CAR T cells in the blood. He declined to, to let us put a needle into his abdominal lymph nodes or into his liver, so we just decided to watch him, and unfortunately, the lesion progressed. Um, he still had CAR T cells, so we gave him a second infusion. So this is interesting to me, because this was the proliferation after the first infusion, the cells declined, uh, and this is where we were when we gave the second infusion. Again, the cells proliferated and declined again, and we had further tumor regression. So what that told us is that this tumor here, um, that there was local resistance, adaptive resistance to the CAR T cells. Now, we don't know whether that's at the level of the T cell or at the level of the tumor cell, but a small proportion of patients with diffuse large cell do express pdl one and it was really disappointing that in this patient we didn't get a biopsy to understand whether that was a mechanism or resistant. Of course, there are other uh, local impediments to T cells, um, and we're now currently doing, uh, uh, when we get biopsies, RNA-seq to look at the CAR T cells and doing metabolic profiling to try and understand what those resistance mechanisms are in the 50% of patients that don't get uh, a complete remission. So this is now data in, C in the CLL cohort uh, on the trial. Um, so this was an interesting group of patients, because CLL, as many of you know, there are really good therapies for now with the brutinib, um, and many of these patients do extremely well. So we only enrolled patients that either had failed a brutinib um, or were uh, intolerant of a brutinib. Now, patients that fail a brutinib typically have a, a median survival of about 
three to five months uh, from John Bird's uh, data. So these are the bad group of patients, and actually getting their cars manufactured before their tumors had progressed uh, uh, you know, to really, really large tumors was often very challenging. But we, we were able to treat uh, um, about 25 patients on this trial, and this was just published in JCO. And you can see that we have a very good uh, response rate. Um, so this is just the waterfall plot, looking at uh, CRs and PRs versus uh, those that progressed. There was a few that progressed on this trial. What's interesting is this is, um, in CLL, you're, you have to use the uh, Lugano CT criteria. So that requires that a patient's lymph nodes be less than 15 millimeters to call them into a CR. Now many of these patients had tumor masses that were 10 or 15 centimeters. So to get those, those big lymph nodes to shrink to less than 15 millimeters was actually, I think, it was going to take some time. So we think that many of these PRs in here are actually um, going to do very, very well. And in fact, it's sort of borne out so far by the survival curve because the PRs are doing as well as the CRs in terms of, uh, of overall survival. And there's very few relapses uh, in this group. Um, now, this is highly effective in CLL. Um, about 85% of the patients actually become flow negative in the bone marrow. And you can see these are the patients that become flow negative versus those that don't. Um, and you can see, again, this is looking at peak CD4s and peak CD8s. And again, the CAR T cell proliferation uh, correlates with a better response. And again, if you look at, and here we're looking at IGH deep sequencing for those that got essentially a molecular remission, and again, having a higher level of CAR T cells uh, at the peak correlated with a deeper remission. So we think that going forward, um, this is going to be um, you know, very important to really understand how we get um, these cells to, uh, to uh, proliferate uh, and persist. Now, one way, of course, is um, to select the cells that have the best capacity to do that, uh, but there may be other ways of doing that. Um, so now in the non-responders um, or patients that have partial responses, this is sort of the flow-through that they go to at our center. They have a pretreatment biopsy where we look at flow cytometry, uh, single-cell RNA-seq, uh, multispectral IHC of their tumor and the tumor microenvironment. Uh, we look at the blood um, in terms of their, their, their endogenous T cells. We look at the product. Uh, and postcard treatment, if they have persisting tumor, we again look at all these uh, parameters to really try and define what the mechanisms of primary and adaptive resistance are. Is it at the level of the T cells that the patient has, the T cell product that we engineer, or is it uh, at the level of the tumor? And I think that the great thing about science these days is we have these sophisticated technologies <coughs> to really go deep and understand uh, how these cells work. So currently, um, the trials that we have ongoing now, the, the trial that I talked about is now uh, pretty much done. Enrollment will publish an update uh, of the, the, the 200 patients. So we do have uh, a, a trial now combining uh, CAR T cells with anti pdl one in, in lymphoma. Um, we have a, a trial in, in CLL where we actually leave the patients on abrutinib. This is based on some data from Carl June and the group at Penn that suggests that abrutinib can actually have positive <coughs> effects on the T cells. So even in patients that are abrutinib refractory, we actually leave them on abrutinib as we engineer the cells. And then we have to try and get around that immunogenicity and potentially go back to less intense uh, lymphodepletion we have a fully human CD19 car that we're testing in lymphoma. Um, I want to talk about toxicities because much is made of toxicity, and this is a really serious <coughs> issue and an important one. And I think if you're going to start, now that some of these products are getting approved, you're going to start treating patients. And I think it really behooves us um, to really try and understand the biology behind the toxicity and to, uh, to really look at mitigating toxicity. So, the first toxicity that was sort of not unexpected is called cytokine release syndrome. And this is due to the T cell being activated by the tumor. Um, it's, the T cell will proliferate, but as it's doing that, it keeps seeing tumor cells. It will keep producing interferon, TNF, and IL-2. The interferon will activate um, other, cell, other immune cells. You'll get a cascade. Things like IL-6 will get produced. So a variety of, of cytokines and chemokines will be elevated uh, when these T cells get activated in, by tumor recognition. We do know now that, um, that CRS is higher in patients that have a high tumor burden. It's higher in patients that get a high CAR T cell dose and can be mitigated by, by dosing to some extent. Um, but there is another toxicity that I want to talk about, neurotoxicity, which was, I don't think, necessarily so expected. Although when I get uh, the flu, 
and my immune system is ramped up, I do get a headache. Um, but this occurs simultaneously or after CRS, and this can be anything from a mild you know, headache like you'd have with the flu, to some confusion, word finding difficulties, uh, vocal neurologic defects, seizures, coma, or cerebral edema, uh, fatal cerebral edema. So there's a broad, broad spectrum of mild to moderate changes, the worst being uh, fatal cerebral edema. Also cerebral hemorrhages have been reported. Now the pathogenesis is not completely understood, and I'm going to go through some data that um, is a little bit of work that we've been doing that really suggests that, that the genesis of this is endothelial activation mediated by cytokines and by very rapid elevations of cytokines in the blood, and I'll go through a little bit of that. And then the final uh, toxicity that I want to talk about is B-cell aplasia, which of course is expected due to on-target toxicity. So this is now looking at 133 patients. This was just published in blood. Just looking at, if you look at patients that got CRS, those that, had, that ended up with, with serious CRS, so grade four, or grade five CRS, you can actually identify those patients within the first 24 hours of their CAR T-cell infusion. If they have a high temperature, if they drop their blood pressure, if their respiratory rate goes up, if their serum albumin goes down, um, you can identify those patients. So, so this is not something that we don't have even a clinical biomarker for. We do. Um, you know, anybody who has a temperature higher than 38.5, in our view, is at high risk for serious CRS. And that occurs within the first 24 hours. So you don't have to wait. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, I think one of the reasons the toxicities were worse was people were afraid to intervene because they thought this was necessary for the anti-tumor effect. And I think we're starting to learn now that you do need to intervene in these patients that are at risk for very serious disease. There are a number of laboratory biomarkers as well um, in terms of measuring the elevations of serum cytokines that we've done uh, that I won't go through that are in, in the paper as well. So the importance of that is it identifies a subgroup of patients for early intervention, and, and now we can start to test that. But I now want to turn to neurotoxicity. So this was just published, and this is the same 133 patients. Now, first of all, the majority of patients get you know, no neurotox or mild neurotox. So you know, if you look at 90, 105 of the 133 patients essentially were grade 0 to 2, very transient neurological abnormalities or none that, that are fully resolvable. But there are some that get, that get serious neurotox, where we look here at, at these patients. And if we look at the ones that had uh, grade five neurotox, they all occurred in our trial during the dose escalation phase of the study. So once we hit that high dose and realized that dose is too high um, for, of CAR T cells, we, we wouldn't anticipate that we would, we would get this. And in fact, when we, once we found the, so these often occur very early in the study, and once you found that you had to use a lower dose, now we're, we're dealing with these lower uh, grades of neurotox. And as you can see, that, that it does tend to sort of occur fairly early here within the first week, so usually after serious CRS, um, uh, sometimes concurrent with it, uh, and then it, it resolves in the vast majority of patients. So there's the occasional patient that has ongoing uh, uh, neurological uh, uh, problems. So what, what does this look like? Well. Most of the time, if you scan them, either CT or MRI, it looks normal. But occasionally, you will see uh, abnormalities. So you can see, for example, white matter lesions in this patient uh, here. Um, uh, here, this is a patient that had cerebral edema. Um, you can sometimes see these cortical lesions. Uh, and sometimes you can even have lesions in the brain stem or the thalamus. So, but all of these, when you really look at them, they look like they're lesions that result from loss of vascular integrity, um, either microhemorrhages, uh, and in fact, if you look just at, is there any evidence that there's disruption of the blood-brain barrier? If you look in the, at, at uh, CSF protein in the patients that get severe neurotox versus those that don't, you can see that during the acute phase, there is an elevation of CSF protein and an elevation of cells in the CSF, some of which are CAR T cells, uh, but there are other inflammatory cells there as well. So we were interested in trying to understand what might be mediating changes in the endothelium. So what we did is we took serum from the group of patients that had, um, that had serious neurotoxicity. Um, so there were, I think, four of them here that had grade four to five neurotox. We just took their serum and we put their serum on uh, human uh, umbilical vein endothelial cells uh, in the presence of serum. And what happens is that if you get endothelial activation, you'll start to lay down uh, these von Willebrand factor multimers. You get this string formation that you see. 
and you can see the strings that are forming. And now, I'm not showing you the controls, but the controls don't have any strings, essentially. This is, this is what you'd see um, you know, in, in, if you put normal serum on there. Um, but with this, so there is clearly factors in the serum that are activating the endothelium. And the other thing we got interested in was um, there is a, um, a condition called cerebral malaria, where some patients get malaria, the, the, the parasite crosses the blood-brain barrier, and they get cerebral malaria. Uh, and it turns out that that's due to abnormalities in angiopotents that are involved in regulating the blood-brain barrier. So angiopotent 1 is protective, and angiopotent 2 is not. It, it actually acts as an antagonist to angiopotent 1. And you can see that angiopotent 2 goes up in the patients that have the great, the serious neurotoxicity, and the ang2 to ang1 ratio also goes up compared to those that don't have neurotoxicity. So the model that we sort of come up with is that there is this uh, rapid elevation of serum cytokines that starts to activate the endothelium, alters angiopotent and angiopotent 1, causes some uh, breakdown in the blood-brain barrier leakage of uh, cytokines across the CSF, and then activation of cells uh, in the subendothelial layer. So things like parasites um, uh, will also get activated, and you get this cascade that ultimately can result in complete disruption of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about B-cell aplasia. Um, so we, I mentioned this EGFRT marker, marker that we have. This was developed by Mike Jensen and we incorporated in most of our cars. Um, so the nice thing about it is, I mentioned it uh, retains the epitope for herbitize. So the question is, could you actually reverse B-cell aplasia by simply giving an infusion of herbitize, which we know mediates ADCC and can eliminate tumor cells. Could it eliminate the CAR T cells? Um, so um, this again is, I'm sorry about the MAC thing, but you can still see this. So this is mice that were treated with CAR T cells, and you can see they become B-cell deficient. This is C19 staining. They become B-cell deficient, and they remain so for, we've carried mice out for 18 months, and they remain B-cell deficient. In the controls, we do give them a little bit of radiation to lymphodeplete them, but the controls will recover their B-cells. Um, so, oh, this is all going to be like this, but anyway, um, I should have checked. Uh, I was here early enough. So if you give Herbitux, and here we're giving Herbitux now about uh, day 50 and day 55, you give two doses five days apart, you can see the B-cells recover nicely, whereas the control mice that get a control antibody, they don't recover at all. This is B-cell recovery in, in the controls that don't get CAR T-cells. Um, and if you even give it late, like five months later, you can still get nice B-cell recovery. Um, and these B-cells are fully functional. Um, if you do immunize the mice, this is the immunization to OVA. You can see they will mount OVA-specific antibody responses. Um, so um, the question is, if you get rid of the CAR T cells, um, will the leukemia come back? Um, we, didn't, we weren't so interested in this experiment, but the reviewers demanded that we do it. So we did the experiment um, where we actually... Treated now mice with an ALL that's, uh, that, that is uh, radiation resistant. So you can see that if you give uh, the, the ALL cells um, uh, or the ALL in the presence of radiation, uh, this, is not, this is just showing the, that the CAR T cells will eliminate the B cells. They will, um, um, and that if you give cetuximab and the B cells recover. recover um, this is now the tumor. You can see that the, the tumors will grow in the mice that don't get CAR T cells, but in the mice that get CAR T cells, the tumors remain absent. And even if you give cetuximab, shown here in blue, where you get elimination of CAR T cells, B cell recovery, you get no uh, tumor recurrence and 100% survival. So if you wait long enough, you can actually uh, uh, eliminate the CAR T cells and reverse the B cell aplasia. So I don't know if I have enough time to do BCMA, do I? Five minutes. Okay. So what about beyond CD19? So we're interested in multiple myeloma. There's a beautiful target called BCMA, which is the B-cell maturation antigen. It's expressed on myeloma and on normal bone marrow plasma cells, um, but it's not expressed on other hematopoietic cells or really anywhere else in the body. And there is already data um, showing efficacy in phase one trials. So we've designed BCMA cars and optimized spacer sequences. These cars function really quite nicely. Um, you know, we picked sort of the best one based on cytokine production and their ability to kill uh, tumor cells. Um, but what we were interested in when we started to look at myeloma cells from patients, we realized that actually a fraction of myeloma patients uh, have intermediate or low levels of expression of BCMA. And if you take these primary myeloma cells from the patient and co-incubate them with CAR T cells, you'll see that the CAR T cells produce much less interferon than against the 
the myeloma cells from patients with high BCMA expression. So this was a potential issue for us because we already know uh, in CD19 treatments that, that antigen loss or downregulation of antigens uh, can actually allow a tumor escape. So the question is, is there anything we can do uh, with BCMA to elevate levels of expression? Well, it turns out that BCMA is regulated on myeloma cells by a molecule called gamma secretase. Gamma secretase cleaves BCMA and releases it into the, into the serum. And so patients that have advanced myeloma actually often have elevated levels of soluble BCMA. And, so, and we know that that BCMA will bind the CAR, uh, so it could inhibit recognition of the, the BCMA on the tumor cell, but moreover, it will actually uh, lower the amount of antigen on the tumor. So the question we asked is, could we give a gamma secretase inhibitor? There are drugs that, are, that inhibit gamma secretase and maintain BCMA expression uh, and reduce uh, the serum levels of BCMA. So this is actually looking now at uh, bone marrow, at soluble BCMA levels in bone marrow and patients that have more than 2%. Uh, this is by flow CD138 positive cells. You can see there's a trend to having much, much higher levels of, of BCMA, uh, soluble BCMA. Um, if you take myeloma cell lines um, and just uh, wash them and put them in culture, you can see they release BCMA very rapidly. Uh, and that BCMA will bind CAR T cells. We're just now staining the CAR using a BCMA FC uh, fusion protein. And you can see that as you titrate in soluble BCMA, you reduce uh, staining of the receptor. So this clearly could be a, a significant problem. Uh, and so we just essentially asked the question, if you took uh, uh, CAR T cells and, and co-cultured them with a tumor line that expressed BCMA, um, could you actually inhibit recognition with soluble BCMA? And here we're using the BCMA FC fusion, and you can see that you definitely can inhibit recognition shown by, uh, by in inhibition of, of interferon production. This is the CD19 CAR, and you can see there's no inhibition. Um, so, and this is true with essentially uh, 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 titrating in uh, BCMA uh, against tumor cell lines, you get uh, much less uh, recognition. So we then um, asked the question, if we took multiple myeloma cells and incubated them with gamma secretase inhibitor, could we elevate BCMA expression? So this is the BCMA level on this tumor cell, this myeloma tumor cell line MM1R. And you can titrate in a, a gamma secretase inhibitor. Um, and here we're using this drug from Roche. Um, you can see that you get a marked upregulation of BCMA. And in fact, this can be as much as 10 to 15 fold, although usually it's around five fold. But that's a huge upregulation in the number of target molecules uh, on the tumor. And this happens very rapidly. So if you put them in the drug within, within really just a few uh, hours, uh, they've upregulated uh, BCMA. So um, if you take patient samples, it's the same thing. So this is now multiple independent patient samples looking at upregulation of BCMA. This is just showing one of them. You can see that all of them upregulate BCMA, um, you know, on average about five to, to seven fold. Uh, in, 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 in the level on the, on, the, on the tumor. And again, as you might imagine, this correlates with better uh, CAR T cell recognition. You can see here's interferon gamma release, uh, five-fold higher here, here about one-and-a-half-fold higher, uh, but on average it goes up with, uh, with all the primary myeloma cells uh, when you incubate them with, with the drug. So we've now taken this into a mouse model where we give the mouse a human myeloma cell line, we give them uh, the gamma secretase inhibitor, and look, in fact, even in vivo, you markedly upregulate BCMA. It is reversible, so you have to continue to give the drug. This is only giving the drug uh, on two occasions. But this does translate um, into a better anti-tumor effect. So here now just uh, two, two uh, uh, doses of drug around the time you give CAR T cells, and a week later, you can see you get a markedly enhanced anti-tumor effect and an improved uh, uh, survival. So. In summary, um, I think what I've tried to tell you is this is a new type of therapy. It is highly effective in refractory B cell malignancies. I think we still have a long way to go in car design and improving the cell products that we actually use. Um, we have to understand why not all patients respond uh, and overcome those, uh, those resistance mechanisms. Uh, and I tried to share with you that I think if we study the pathogenesis of the toxicity, we will be able to come up with intervention strategies to really make this a much safer therapy. Beyond CD19, there are many, many targets that we're working on and many combination therapies. The gamma secretase inhibitor is just one of them. Um, just to uh, acknowledge the people in the lab, many of them I mentioned along the way. I just should mention Margot Ponce done the BCMA work. Uh, 
I mentioned the clinical team. Uh, we've opened an adoptive T-cell therapy clinic. Uh, this is uh, one of our patients who's now three years post-CAR T-cells for lymphoma, uh, and she cut the ribbon uh, at the opening. Uh, and I need to acknowledge the funding, particularly from the NIH, which really funded the initiation of this work, and Juno Therapeutics that's funded the clinical trials. Thank you.